Okay, quick little flipped lecture on gene linkage. Um, common example that we can think of is like when two genes are linked together when they technically travel together at the same time. Uh, that would be things like in, in your experience, like you see red hair and like fair skin, or red hair and freckles, or dark skin tone with dark hair colors, or dark skin tone with darker eye colors. Um, so there's a lot of genes that are very, you know, they're always connected, they're always linked together. Um, we have to unthink what we already know here a little bit and get to the, the, the reality that to this point what we've assumed is that the genes that we always study, if there's two genes, they're in two different homologous chromosomes. So let's say we have an example of like heterozygous for one trait and heterozygous for another trait. What that really means and what some of you are not accepting or not really understanding is that that means that there's a big A on one chromosome and on its homologous partner there's a little a. So the gene dominant, whatever that is, and the recessive gene over here. I don't write them over here just because it kind of gets too cramped for space, but since it's a duplicated chromatid, that would mean this would be big A over here, this would be little a over here. Same thing down here is the second homologous pair. If you remember the formula, if, with two homologous pairs you should be able to get four varieties of gametes. Remember that 2 to the n formula that we studied before. So you should be able to get four, four different varieties. This is metaphase 1 of meiosis. Homologous pairs line up in partners. Then they get pulled to the sides, as I've kind of shown here in my little drawing. And all of the cells over here are going to end up with big A and big B paired together. And the cells that end up over on this side are going to be little a, little b. So you get two different varieties out of that. But if they independently assort, and this is where independent assortment comes in, it's a major, major key concept, and they will ask you tons of times on the AP test. If they independently assort, then when they go and they split up, they segregate, you're going to end up with uh, little a with big B. Remember, independent assortment just means the pair can flip. It's independent of the other pair. So now little a goes with big B, and on this side, these resulting cells over here are going to be big A, little b. So altogether, we get big A with big B, or we get little a with little b, or we get little a with big B, or we get big A with big B. You've done it this way shorthand, not realizing you're actually doing meiosis, but that's what you're doing. That's what we've done up to this point. But what if there's more than one gene per chromosome? Um, T.H. Morgan was a guy who studied this stuff, and it's in Fruit Flies. And 15.3 is what you should read through if you haven't already. Um, and what he did was he studied two different traits on Fruit Flies. One trait controls body color and the other for wing type. Um, you can pause this anytime and take notes out if you need, if you need to. But basically what he said was gray body is dominant over black body. Notice that he used pluses instead of capital letters. So B plus anything is dominant over little b, little b. Okay? So gray body over black body. And then the next trait was going to be uh, normal wings, which is VG plus, is dominant over vestigial wings. What vestigial means is that they're, they don't work. They're just crappy little curly wings. Okay? So here's what he did. He took a fruit fly that was gray bodied and normal wings. In other words, he knew it was B plus, B plus. He had done many, many crosses, and he knew that he had what's called a purebred. So he knew that he had a B plus, B plus, and VG plus, VG plus. So gray body, homozygous dominant, and normal wings, homozygous dominant. And he crossed it with, he mated it with this double mutant, uh, one that had a black body and vestigial wings, little curly wings. Okay. Now, what can be passed down from this? Remember, one set from this and one from this set, right? So this one is always going to pass down, no matter how you combine them, is always going to pass down B plus, VG plus. And this one over here is always going to pass down BVG. So when you combine B plus and VG plus and BVG, you get this organism right here. All of, it, all of his F1s, all of his first generations, were heterozygous for each trait. Then he crossed them again with another double mutant. Okay. Now what you'd normally think to happen is just like a Punnett square here. This hybrid, or I'm sorry, this dihybrid here, would create either eggs that are B plus VG plus, BVG, B plus VG, or BVG plus, like just foiling this, right? So you'd get those four types. And this bugger over here is always going to give you BVG, no matter what you do. So that's all we need to write down is BVG. Then these are the outcomes. And if this is a normal Punnett square, what you end up with is that you should get one-fourth, 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 one-fourth. But he didn't get that. 
here's what he got. He got a whole bunch of these, two, and very few of these. The bunches of these were just like the original parents. And so that got him thinking about something. So what he found, what he discovered here, and we'll get to it eventually here, is that Morgan found that body color and wing size are usually inherited together. He noted that these genes do not assort independently. They don't give you that one-fourth to one-fourth to one-fourth to one-fourth ratio. What he reasoned was they must be on the same chromosome. The crazy thing about this is that he had never known that chromosomes existed. The studies were done in like 1912. Um, he just basically imagined all of this stuff, and it worked out mathematically. So here's what he imagined. He imagined that his dihybrid female, that was B plus B, VG plus VG, right? Heterozygous for both traits. That the B plus and the VG plus that it got must have been from its parent, its one parent. And the BVG must have come from the other parent. And then his test cross, remember that double mutant, was BVG and BVG. So this bugger is going to always pass down a BVG. That's what ends up down here on the blue ones. Always going to, it's going to be this or this. And this one is going to pass down either this, B plus, VG plus, or this. And then again, what you guys should be able to kind of uh, presume that blows my mind that he did was, okay, there weren't just these two types that came out of this. This would be gray bodied and normal winged. And this would be black bodied and crappy winged. But he had two other varieties, but very small numbers of them, but not insignificant. Um, what accounted for that? Here's what he figured out. He figured out that crossing over accounts for those new combinations. He called those recombinant genes because they're recombining from the original chromosome. So he assumed crossing over and recombinant genes without knowing that DNA existed or chromosomes existed. It's mind-blowing. So here's kind of the way that we can think about it now. You got crossing over occur up here. You separate them out in meiosis one. Here's meiosis two. You're going to end up with types that are just like the parents, like the all blue or all red. Um, and then you're going to end up with recombinant types as well. You're going to end up with a bunch of different uh, recombinant types in this whole thing. So there's parental, parental, um, parental. There's another parental there, I guess. There's your four parentals and your four different recombinant genes. Take a look at that if you need to, um, but it should kind of make sense to you. So here's what he did. He said these were the normal eggs that didn't recombine, and then these were the ones that recombined. And no matter what happened over here, if crossing over happened, you're still going to get BVG. So think about that, pause on that, and think about that if you need to. But here, if crossing over occurs, sometimes you get these tips to cross over, and you end up with recombined versions. And you also still end up with parental types, B+, plus, VG+, plus, and BVG. So that helps explain these eggs and these eggs are very, very common. These are less common. Now, what can make things even, uh, even increasingly less common, like crazy uncommon? Well, if you can picture, if these two things, if these two traits, like B plus and VG, are super close together, the chances that crossing over will happen in the middle of them is really, really slim. And so he just determined that if you can figure out how often they recombine using this thing called a recombination frequency, then you can determine how far apart the genes are. So if the genes are super far apart from each other, it's probably going to cross over. But if they're really close to each other, they probably don't. So think red hair and freckles. Those genes must be very, very close together on a chromosome because it's rare that you don't get that combination. But other things like red hair and blue eyes, red hair and green eyes, red hair and brown eyes, like those things must be further apart on chromosomes because they tend to actually happen more commonly. Okay, So recombination frequency, simple, simple thing here. You just take all the recombinants that you get, so not the parental types. You take all the recombinants, total of those, 391, add those together, right, out of the total offspring. So out of all of these then. So you end up, it's just a percentage, times 100 gives you 17%. So he said, okay, it's recombination frequency, that's 17%. Then he took it one step further, and he said, basically, if you calculate the RF frequency, again, you can tell how far apart the genes are. Low recombination frequencies mean they're probably really close together. High recombination frequencies probably means they're way far apart. That also tells you how the distances are. He decided to use distances and name them after himself. We'll get that there in a second. This is a confusing part here. The highest RF value uh, that, that you can get is 50%. Why is that? I tried to kind of illustrate that on the next slide here. 
if you have two genes that are really close together, if we kind of look into that, like here's this homologous pair of chromosomes, and A and B are really, really close together, we only have this little tiny distance in which this crossing over can occur. That makes it kind of unlikely in a low frequency. But a high frequency, the recombination frequency being high, would be like if those two genes are on opposite ends of the chromosome, how often would they recombine and what would you end up with recombinants? Like how many recombinants would you end up with in the pool? Well, if these two cross over, like if we take these two tips right here and cross them over, like right here, see I just did that right there. If you cross them over and then swap them, then you end up with this. So you got A with B, little a now with B, big A with little b, and little a with little b. So we crossed over right here, back here, and then they pulled apart, right? And then the end result here is you're going to end up with sperm or egg that are big A, big B, little a, little, uh, big B, big A, little b, little a, big b. Notice that this one here is just like the parent, and this one here is just like the parent, and you get half of them being recombinant. And the most commonly that can, the most common way that can happen is they represent half of all of the types of offspring. So that's the same as independent assortment at that point. So we don't really know if they're on the same chromosome or not at that point. So 50% are like the parent and 50% are recombinant. That's why your recombination frequency could top out at 50%. You can't get higher than that. So again, using RF values, what we do is we draw linkage maps. And those linkage maps are genetic maps of chromosomes based on the recombination frequencies. The distances between genes can be expressed as map units. He called them centimorgans, uh, kind of a very conceited dude. Um, but he called them centimorgans. So T.H. Morgan named the measurement after himself. Every centimorgan represents a 1% recombination frequency. So map units indicate relative distance and order, but not precise locations of genes. So you can get, if you know that like Maple Grove is X miles from Plymouth, and Maple Grove is X miles from St. Michael, and St. Michael and Plymouth are X miles apart. If you take all of that into consideration, you can plot down on a, you know, Highway 94 on a highway where each of those is located because you can do the quick math there. For the same reason, Morgan gets to a point where he realizes, like, this gene and this gene, they're 9% apart. This gene and this gene are 9.5% apart. Um, the two of them... It, it kind of rounds off oddly, but the two of them end up being somewhere around 17% apart or so. And you keep doing maps and maps and maps. And again, it's all rounding errors here because you're always going to get a little bit of slop in your data. But what we end up being able to do then is map out like human chromosomes. So like this is a human chromosome. Here's a centromere that would be located here. And then we've been able to map out like uh, PKU gene is like right here. Amylase gene is right here. You get all of these different genes, and they're very, very, I chose one that you could actually read, but literally we have them all mapped out because we can tell how often they recombine. Okay, so that is what uh, Morgan was doing. Um, your job now is to take a look at the practice problems that have been assigned to you from 15.3, and I do have another flipped lecture on how to walk through some of those problems. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense about gene linkage. Uh, thanks for watching this.